This won't be a normal episode of Attaché. We won't be dwelling on our usual pragmatisms, the airport info, the money, none of that. Why? Because you're never going to come to Beirut. You've seen the news, you've read the Foreign Office and State Department advisories, the warnings are stark, the language is unambiguous. Come to Beirut at your own risk. Mention Beirut as a possible destination to friends and family, and you'll be greeted with the same raised eyebrows and furtive glances that I was. Beirut, they'll say? Isn't that a little dangerous? And let them think that, at least for a while, because that leaves all the more of this wonderful city for you and me. I'll admit it, the first time I came to Beirut a few years ago, I was scared. It's easy to get caught up in the media hyperbole. This is a story they love to tell. Just a few miles that way, they'll say, Syria, ISIS to the south, the contentious border with Israel, the Golan Heights. It sells newspapers, it makes for compelling docudrama, but it's a frustrating narrative because there's so much more to this wonderful city than its painful past. Yes, the wounds are fresh, yes, the wounds are deep, but Beirut is not defined by its scars, and nor should it be. So yes, I will admit I was scared when I first came here, but I'm also happy to admit I was wrong. Cosmopolitan, relaxed on just about every level, and, dare I use this word, hip. Beirut rivals any other Mediterranean city. So stow whatever preconceived notions you had. This isn't some desolate, war-ravaged corner of the globe. This is paradise. The Lebanese are an incomparably friendly and welcoming people. They'll approach you. They'll talk to you. They'll feed you. Yes, they know you're a tourist, so drop the charade and embrace their hospitality. It is unparalleled. It shouldn't come as a surprise then that in a defining display of a people's generosity, Lebanon has welcomed more Syrian refugees than any other country in the world, welcoming over two million people displaced by that country's civil war. That influx of people increased the population of Lebanon by over 50%, almost overnight. By the way, the UK has taken in 10,000 refugees today. Do with that information what you will. Lebanon has great food. But you already knew that because no matter where in the world you live, you've probably sampled it in one form or another. Lebanese food and food culture has traveled to the far corners of the earth thanks to the massive Lebanese diaspora. Around 14 million people of Lebanese descent live outside of Lebanon. That's over three times the size of the entire population of the country. And when they scattered across the globe, they brought with them all that is great about Lebanese food. And for that, the entire world thanks them. Hisham and Ifat, both Beirutis and both Lebanese food culture experts who introduce us to Armenian flatbread. It's uh, an Armenian bakery and they are specialized in uh, flat bread, which is called uh, lahm ba'jin, and in some cultures it's called lahm ashun. Armenians fled to Beirut after the Armenian Genocide in 1915 and built thriving communities throughout the city. Their flatbread is one of their many contributions to Beiruti and Lebanese food culture. The difference between the uh, flatbread that is done here and everywhere, every other bakery is that it's uh, paper thin and crunchy and uh, people come and they deliver everywhere and they come especially to eat that along with other products which we may look at when we go inside. Uh, they open every day except Monday and they close at 3 p.m. which is pretty soon so if you want to try their specialty you'd better hurry up. Alongside the traditional lakhmajun, we try a pomegranate molasses version, a specialty of this particular bakery. Wow. Is it good or what? Amazing. <laughs> 
Ifat, a former teacher, like many Lebanese we met, had recently returned to Beirut after spending several years overseas. I'm loving the, the thriving culture of this city. I, I can't live anywhere else. I've traveled a lot. I like traveling, but I always want to come home. Around every corner, down every street, you can find a dish at the heart of Lebanese and indeed Middle Eastern food as a whole, falafel. But in Beirut, falafel is art. Nader is a master falafel chef. You like it spicy, right? Yes, I'm sure you've had falafel in the past, but my friend, you ain't had falafel like this. This one is mainly chickpeas. In other places, they use more fava because it's cheaper. Uh, fava beans are cheaper, but um, the taste is not the same. This I've is... never had it with the mint either. Warm, fresh, satisfying. It is without equal. Eats falafel every day. Yeah. He always eats, although he works here and he does it, and I can see he doesn't get bored of it. He, he still eats yeah. falafel every day. Every day, that's same. But different yeah. variety. Beirut overflows with creativity. Artisans of every kind fill the streets with their creations, and in many cases, challenge the old and accepted way of doing things. The owners are two young engineers, and uh, they realize that they can produce organic local honey 12 months a year because we are blessed with uh, good weather. We don't have harsh winters, we don't have harsh summers. And something is blooming all year round at any point in ah, time. So there's always something for the bees to eat. Exactly. And we have different elevations as well. They decided, OK, we can do that by moving the beehives according to the seasons. So every three to four months, the beehives are moved so the bees can continue to feed on natural uh, flowers and trees. They explained to me that in some countries it gets too hot or yeah. too cold. I was going to say, you must be one of the few countries in the yeah. world that can do that. I had heard whispers of a place in Beirut that under no circumstances was I to overlook. A place that embodies the city's creativity, its hospitality, and, to put it simply, its deliciousness. The Russian Forbes uh, put it uh, between the 10 uh, best ice cream in the world was the second. Second worldwide second ice cream. Second best ice cream in the world. In the world. How can you possibly say no to some of the best ice cream in the world? No sugar in it to keep the taste of the ice cream, okay? Because if it was with sugar, you will lose the taste of the ice cream later. We put all the milk downstairs, the base milk. This is pistachio, the caramelized almond. We have the strawberry, apricot with pine nuts, lemon, Lemon. And you start with the rose water. Refresh your mouth before you eat the ice cream. This is how to be full. Thank you. Okay. So officially the world's best ice cream. So say the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, just about every other magazine yes. in the world. And how are you gonna have it? Wow. In the summer, that's all I would want. I wouldn't eat anything except that. Even shrapnel scars and bullet holes can't dampen the mood in the world's best ice cream store. I think that says a lot about this city. The sounds of Beirut in the morning. The constant drone of traffic, the call to prayer, the chatter of crowded coffee shops. Life. Despite what the rest of the world might think, Beirut is going about its business today like it did yesterday, and like it will tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. There's a funny thing, like, everybody thinks, like, at least the friends that I hang out with, the first people I met in Europe when I first traveled, everybody thought, like, we still have camels and tents. And... Karim is an artist and entrepreneur based in Beirut. 
He's passionate about this city and keen for the world to see the modern, creative city that he calls home. Not anymore. We are a kind of sophisticated country compared to other Arab countries. It's, it, this country probably has to work harder than any other country to reset people's expectations. Yeah. Because if it's not, if it's not that, then it's the 80s. Yeah. And the Absolutely. civil wars and the war with Israel. Wow. Camel and tent. In the heart of Beirut's revitalized downtown area, you'll find Souk El Tayeb, a weekly farmer's market showcasing Lebanon's food and farming prowess. Producers from all over the country flock to this market every week, and the display and array is dazzling. Peanuts, oil, and salt. Uh, wal walnut oil, a little bit, and salt coffee. Perfect. Clean, organic, simple food at its finest. A long scar runs down the center of Beirut, the Green Line. This is where, where everything happened. This is what classified us into Christian or Muslim, East or West Beirut. It's the place that represents, every, that represents everything, exactly. Yeah. So from this part upwards, it was East Beirut. This part down, it was West Beirut. At the time, it was one of the tallest buildings in the area, and so of huge strategic significance, not to mention a particularly attractive nest for snipers. And in a bizarrely macabre display of battlefield protocol, it was also the spot where warring militias would meet on a regular basis. Even when they were fighting, they would, they would come and meet. They, they, would, they would conduct meetings to see like what to do, where to go. This zone is yours, this one is mine. Really? Yeah. Basically, we are in the middle of downtown Beirut, and we still have these traces. Maybe as Lebanese, I stopped seeing this because I, I pass by here every day. But with the graffiti growing on it, it's a reminder of our mistakes and downfalls and bad decisions. But wow. it's really messed up, like how we, we, we don't see this anymore. No. It's part of our daily life. And is the graffiti meant to bring attention, make sure that you don't forget. Actually, I see it in another way. The graffiti is part of like putting all of this past behind and just trying to make it something else, trying to make a piece of art out of it. Everywhere you look in Beirut, there are scenes of hope, progress, healing, but none are perhaps as potent as the site of its Grand Mosque and its Catholic Cathedral, two overwhelmingly beautiful and important buildings sitting peacefully side by side. I'm not Muslim, but I, I relate to it in a way or another. Mm -hmm. That's a place where you can feel the good energy. Yeah, yeah. You can feel uh, now it's calm, but usually when there are thousands of people praying, I definitely get this good vibe of peace and love and prayer, loving one God, one Creator. I all, this always reaches me. Welcome. Where are you from? Where? Uh, California. Yeah, welcome. California. Yeah. An American. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. Abu Ahmed is one of the many proprietors selling his wares in the Basta neighborhood's extraordinary antique market. Shukran, Abu Ahmed. You're welcome. Thank you. But this is an antiques market like none other. The treasures that line the narrow corridors are the leftovers of a people's history. Abandoned by their owners who fled the country, looted by opportunistic petty criminals, or sold by distant relatives at the end of a dynasty. This isn't just an antiques market, it's a time machine. It's a staggering collection and it just keeps going and going and going. And one remarkable thing, as I was telling you, like some pieces are super expensive and they would never like bargain or go less with the prices. They know that they are super expensive, super rare, maybe one piece item and this is it. This is the crazy thing is that, that everything is from somebody's 
normal life. It's like it, you were walking through like a museum, a living museum. Yeah, it feels like a messed up but very beautiful museum. While many Lebanese fled Beirut in the 20th century, in the 21st, they're returning in droves. The Hamadani brothers run a successful vintage furniture store and came back to Beirut after several years in Canada. There seems to be a lot of that, of people that are coming back. Yeah. It feels... Life's not... The, it's really... Uh, you'd rather build your future here, and it'll probably take longer couple years longer, then build it there, and then plan on coming back. We thought this place was so different. Yeah, you know that's what, I mean? what we're trying to change is, you know, first time I- First I came, time you come here? No, no, I've been here a few times, but the first time I came here, I was scared. I was yeah, it's legitimately normal. scared, and you know, you, 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 the media hyperbole is so easy to buy into. You come in here, it's like me going to Detroit. Yeah, you have a you perception. Know, because of people always tell you, but Detroit's not bad. No, I've been to Detroit. Detroit. Detroit's cool. Yeah. People are cool, but that's, it's media. Nobody cares. Like, Nobody I cares. I was in the war of 2006, and whenever there's a bomb in town, like, oh. yeah, there's nothing. Warm, nothing. Yeah. People are not scared. Like mm. That calmness in that day-to-day -day is the, the biggest F you you can give to somebody that's trying to intimidate you. And then he just wants to eat tabbouleh at the end of the day. <laughs> it is almost impossible not to be enchanted by a country and a people that overflow with such optimism. Where as a visitor, you will be welcomed with warmth and generosity unlike anything I have ever experienced. And while Beirut may not have featured in your travel plans so far, I hope after all of this, you reconsider. Should you come to Beirut? Absolutely. This city, this country has shown the world time and time again how to recover, how to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and get on with it. And for that, I admire, respect, and adore Beirut. We couldn't have done this episode without the support of Bank du Lebon Accelerate. Particular thanks to Samir Karam and Paul Papadimitriou for all their hard work in bringing this episode to life.